Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning, Crossroads Church. How's everyone doing this morning? It's so good to see all of you here. And for those of you who are watching online, it's great to have you as well. If you're ever in the area, make sure to stop by and worship with us. Amen. So we are in a series entitled The Call. And you will be hearing a ring throughout this series. It's a telephone ring, and it goes something like this. Oh, look at that. On the other side of that ring is not little Johnny. It's not a telemarketer. It's not a business person. It's not your ex-wife. It's going to be the Spirit of God wanting to speak to you, wanting to... Uh, encourage you to come and and follow, come and experience what so many people around the world have experienced, God's goodness. Amen? Amen. 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 And speaking of the call, little Johnny was out working on a farm, and he was out checking uh, fences and looking at all the fences, and all of a sudden, he came upon an emergency. And so immediately, he calls his dad. He goes, Dad, I just ran over a pig, but it's under the tractor. What do I do? Dad was, son, he goes, shoot it. And go and bury it. He goes, okay, Dad, I'll do that. So he hangs up the phone, and about 20 minutes later, he calls back again. He goes, Dad, I did it. He goes, but what do I do about the motorcycle and the camera? (laughs) Anyways, some of you guys will get that later. Bad joke. It's probably not a good example of the call in the current series or the current culture that we're living in, but the the series is entitled The Call. And so let me just give you a, a recap real quick. We began this series with... Um, the, the initial call in Scripture when Jesus says, hey, I want you to come and see. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Come and see. Amen. Hey, Jesus, where are you dwelling at? Where's your dwelling place? Where's your home at? Come and see. And so the invitation was to come and see. And what did we see? When you look at Scripture, we see a mess. We see the world was in a mess. The disciples were in a mess. Everyone, But what we saw was a person finally not running away from the mess, or shaming the mess, we saw the master diving right into the mess. And so he's saying, look, come and see. You're going to see something you haven't been seeing. The religious people, the people that should be in charge, they're shaming you. That's not who my, my dad is. I'm not like that. What you see me do, that's who my father's heartbeat is. Amen. And then Pastor Joel came last week and he said, not only do you want to come and see, but I need you to come and learn. Come and learn how I operate this way. And the fundamental way that we can operate that way in the life that we're living in today is through humility. We have to allow humility to be the foundation and the root of how we serve people. Because if we're not, pride will come in and we're just sitting there and we're judging people. Man, I can't believe you're living this way. I can't believe you're in that kind of a mess. Look at me. Look how I do it. Well, that's going to set you up for a fall. Pride comes before the fall. Amen. So he says, do this through humility. So today, now, he says, now that you understand, now that you're learning how to do this through humility, now I want you to come and follow. In other words, what you see me do to others, I need you to do that to them. What you see me do to those that are ugly, those that are shameful, those that are trying to harass you and trying to kill you, follow my example. Woo, man. So this morning, it's not an easy message so, but don't feel condemned. Don't feel shameful. Don't walk out of these doors as if though, man, that's just too hard. I'm on vacation, Pastor. That's too difficult. I want you to be encouraged because God will not only uh, 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 show you how to follow him, but he'll empower you to follow him as well. Amen? So that's where we're at. This morning's message is entitled, Come and Follow. You know, years ago, 99, 19, uh, 2007, we began church. We began Crossroads. I was excited. We were both excited. Uh, the call was there upon us. The vision was very, very clear. He says, go tell them how much I love them. So we answered that call. And the easy part was to tell people how much God loved them. The difficult part was to show them. We were challenged to show them. In other words, the Spirit of God was showing us. He says, I want their burdens to become your burdens. I want their pain to become your pain. I want their hurt and their struggle to become your struggle. So for the first five years, we were down at the Coliseum, and we were setting up, breaking down, setting up and breaking down, and I was getting burdened. I'm like, man, I'm tired of this. 
I was, you know, we were, we're actively involved in people's lives, and we still are. We put our actions on display. Then it came time to share my burdens. I was like, I've been doing this for five years. i got to show you my burden now. Because now I want my burden to become our burden. I am looking for a place. We need a place to serve out of. We need a facility. We need a place of residence so that we can minister to our community. Help me. I think we found a place, and this was the place, 3455 U.S. Highway 90 here in Seguin, Texas, way on the west side of town, <laughs> the very extreme west. And so people were saying, man, pastor, I love that. I, you know, I'm with you, and I'm for you. And I remember there was this one couple that came up to us, and they said, Pastor, man, we love you. We love this church. It's so awesome. We just can't wait to come every Sunday. He goes, but that whole idea about, you know, coming and helping you with this, with this facility over here, whenever you get that facility running, we'll be back. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? I was like, man, I need you now. I don't need you then. I need you now. He goes, well, we just don't like capital campaign. I said, we don't have one. We're just asking you to help us. Let this burden become your burden. Come help me. We'll be back, Pastor. I've never seen them since. I've never seen them since. Isn't that crazy? Can you believe that? I can believe that. (laughs) We've experienced that over and over again. But here's what's common to every single one of us. We've all had people whose promises didn't match their performance. We've all had people in our lives who are just all talk and no walk. Isn't that the truth? Don't look at your neighbor now. We all had people that are all bark and no bite. All hammer and no nails. All foam and no beer. All show and no go. Isn't that the truth? You know, like a friend, he promises you, Pastor, I'll never tell. Let me in on your secrets. So you share your burdens. You share your heart. Next thing you know, there's a post on Facebook. There's a post on Instagram. Or your spouse. You know, you come up and you meet that beautiful lady. You meet that beautiful guy. And he's over there saying, man, I'm going to love you unconditionally till the very end. And, you know, you're just, you're, you're, you're just, you know, enamored by his love and his affection. When you look at him, you see halos on his head. All of a sudden, three months down the road, those things turn into horns. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? It's not matching up anymore. It's not matching up. Or like Judas, who said, he, I'll follow you, Jesus, but I'll also betray you. I'll also steal from you. I'll also kiss you and then send you to the cross. We've all had individuals like that, presidents, who tell us all these promises during their campaign, and these are failed promises. Natalie and I were watching Napoleon Dynamite last night. He's like, man, I'm going to vote for Pedro. (laughs) Amen. All your wildest dreams will come to pass. I love Pedro. Question, what do you do with people like that? What do you do with individuals that betray you, that say one thing but live their life in, in, in a different manner, and you're affected by it. How do you treat, how do you behave with individuals like that? Who gets to decide how to behave with people like that? What would Pastor Joel do? We all know that, for those of you who know him. But the answer is, we don't get to decide how we should behave. Let me explain. First century Christians, Christians they were lovers of Jesus, Jesus was not only Lord of their prayers and their rituals. Jesus was Lord of how they behaved their lives. They understood that even though the kingdom of God was not from this world, it was actually for this world. Isn't that the truth? You did that. You, you, You know that by their lifestyle. You know that by how they behaved. And wherever the disciples lived, wherever they went to, wherever they traveled to, whatever city they went into, Man, they impacted that area. It became better. It became stronger. It became more vibrant. A light would come in, not because of what they believed, but because of how they behaved. How they believed was one thing. As a matter of fact, how they believed was what put them to death. How they believed was what was the cause for their persecution. Remember, Stephen was there, and he believed, but they called him a blasphemer. And so they took stones, and they stoned him, to the ground, to his very death, all in the name of God, all in the name of what the scriptures that they were reading, they were adamant to obey. That led them to, you know, cause those individuals to just become martyrs. The early church was persecuted. 
and put to death because of what they believed. But when they saw how they behaved, things started transforming in their lives. It was their behavior that opened up the doors. When, when, when pandemics came and infanticide would come, you know, the religious people would send these kids, they would, they would make them outcasts. But it was the Christians, it was the early Christians that when those moments would happen, they would run to that mess. They would go and capture, they would go and minister healing to those that were afflicted and wounded and had viruses and pandemics, where even some of themselves, they even got sick and died themselves while they were hurting, while they were ministering to the hurting. They wouldn't let these children off the side of a river get swallowed by animals there in the wild, in the dark, in the night. They would go and rescue them and bring them into their own home at the expense of their own possible death as well. And today, if we're not careful in our culture today, our believing will become a substitute for our following. We're not only called to believe. When Jesus said, I don't want you only to believe in me, but I need you to behave like me. And that's the challenge of this morning's message. Natalie and I were at a beach, and I guess I got a little darker because there's like everybody was saying, goes, man, you're dark, you're dark. It's like, okay, whatever. I bless you. <laughs> we're at the beach, and we saw this. You know, everybody's seen kids following their parents and stuff. We saw this cute little boy, maybe two, three years old, and Daddy was out there strutting himself with his six-pack and mustache. <laughs> And Natty was like, do you see that? It's like, no, you better stop seeing that. (laughs) But what we saw, I don't know what she saw. I know what I saw. What I saw was the little boy following in daddy's steps. He was putting his feet where dad was stepping. And that's the picture right there of us as believers. We are following in the steps of Jesus. How we see him behave is how we are to behave question. Are you a believer or are you a follower? It's one thing to believe. Even the demons believe and they tremble, the scripture says. But are we a follower? Philippians, the second chapter, says it this way. Apostle Paul, he says, work out your own salvation. Work means that there's something we have to do with fear and trembling, for it is God working in you both to will and to have the grace, to to, to have the will, and to empower you to do for his glory, for his honor. That's authentic faith. Authentic faith is faith that does something. Um, The brother of of Jesus, James, he says it this way. Because James 2.14, he goes, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, someone claims to believe, but doesn't behave well? but has no deeds to follow that. Because what good is that? Faith that doesn't do any good is no good. Faith that doesn't do any good, you need to tattoo that right there. Faith that doesn't do any good is no good. Have you ever noticed, no one ever pushes back when people say, hey, brother, you need to walk your, you know, you need to, you need to walk your talk. And I've had, you know, when my wife comes and tells me, goes, hey, Don't tell me that you love me. Show me that you love me. I'm like, time out, sister. I love you. I told you when I married you, I love you. Still the same. My promise is still true. But we can all agree that we, you know, for me, when people say, hey, you got to walk your talk, I'm challenged by that. I'm challenged by that. And so I got to grit it out and work that salvation out with fear and trembling, knowing that people are watching wherever I am at. Amen? A lot of times I succeed, there are many times I've failed. And I repent and I get back up and I got to keep moving forward. But the pushback, nobody, nobody, pushes, nobody pushes back when that, but the pushback comes when, when we talk about the specifics. How are we supposed to behave? What does behaving look like? There's pushback there. And we've all seen it. Everybody has their own version of how they're supposed to behave. Like our tia, mijo. You can't be living like that. Did you see who walked through these doors? Mira. I just saw her at the baile. Right? Street preachers. We've seen one. We have one in town. I'm not going to call his name out, but I should. He called my name out, but I'm not supposed to render evil for evil. You know, he's damning people. He's there in the parade. 
He's like shaming. You're going all going to hell. We're just trying to celebrate the 4th of July, man. You're going to hell. God hates evil people. God hates gay people. And they're holding signs and all kinds of stuff. We've all seen individuals. Here's the, here's the deal, though, is that those individuals, they're sincere about their beliefs. They really think that they are working and operating on behalf of what their God is telling them to do, just like Saul did. Saul went and got papers to go and persecute and kill followers of Christ from the religious people. And they were basing all that upon what they were reading in Scripture from the Torah, Old Testament. We have a New Testament with the new king, with the new law. It's called the law of love. It's called the law of Christ. <clears throat> the law of Christ that lives on the inside of us should take residence, to, should take priority in our lives, right? Yeah. Both of them believe they're right. So who gets to decide how to behave? What does it look like to work out your own faith? You know, James said, be doers. Do what? What does that look like? The answer is, like I said a minute ago, we don't get to decide. It's already been decided. It's already been portrayed. It's already been in Scripture and given us an example and modeled in Scripture. Philippians, the second chapter, continuing that verse, God's working in us and says, do all things, not just some of the things, all things without complaining and disputing. It's easy for us to just shout back at him, isn't it? That you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the middle of this crooked and perverse 2022 generation, among whom we should be shining as lights in this world. Here's my point. Being right and believing right doesn't make us shine. It's behaving right that makes us shine. Has the church lost its shine? If we're not careful, we'll lose are shining, will not be impacting the kingdom for his glory and for his honor. Jesus said it this way. This is what's going to say to set you apart, how you behave differently. He says, you love others like I have loved you. Who's my neighbor? You remember that story? It's the individual that went down, bent down, and, and, and pressed into the wounded individual, helped him, got him back up, nurtured him, banded his wounds, took him to an end, Paid for a couple more days to stay in there. He goes, that's my neighbor, not the religious individuals that look by and like, huh, he deserves that. He made his mess, let him stay in it. That's the right thing to do. Maybe they'll learn one day. Maybe you'll learn one day. Isn't that the truth? Think about this. How do you behave when things don't go your way? How do you behave when all your efforts, all your praying, all your believing, all your giving is for naught? When you've given your best, but there's no promotion. When you love your hardest, but you still find yourself alone by yourself. When you go that extra mile and you still get burned. What makes us different? Our behavior makes us different. And so often... What they see in our lives is no different than what they see in their everyday life. And if we're not careful, our actions will undermine our faith and we lose credibility as a follower of Jesus. Oh, yeah, you believe in Jesus, but you don't act like him. Right? People love Jesus, but they don't like the church. We got to flip that. How do you do that? By believing more? By getting a more education? No, by behaving more. Pastor, ouch, that hurts. It's true. I'm on vacation too. <laughs> it's during your most challenging moments in life that this idea of come and following him, that's when he graces you and empowers you to rise above those moments. God's forgiveness. How, how do they experience God's forgiveness unless they've committed a sin against you? How do the individuals experience God's compassion unless you see them in need and you follow after them to help them in their time of need? How do they experience and know God's healing power unless when you see them, they're afflicted and they're wounded and they're fractured and they're torn up because of stuff that's happened to them 
Unless you go down and bend your knee in those moments and help them. We know he's the answer, but he wants to work through our lives to help those individuals in those times. Jesus said it this way. If you only love those that love you, what benefit have you? It's easy for us to go and love our brothers. It's easy to go bake a cake and enchiladas and everything for those that love us. But what about the dude that you see every single day in that same corner in that same spot? Man, Natty and I, we just got back. We just got us some water burger and fries. We're on our way back home. And in this, we stopped at that stoplight, and there's this dude smoking a cigarette, looking cocky, but I don't know what was going on. Now he's like, give him your fries. I'm like, no, I didn't give him my fries. <laughs> I've been meditating on this, service, this message all week long. I'm like, man. So I opened up the window. I said, here you go, brother. He goes, man, thank you. It's, it's our behavior, amen? It's our behavior. I have hope, though, with this church. I love this community called Crossroads Church. Why? Because you're exemplifying that today. You exemplify that over and over and over in this community. You give when it hurts you to give. You minister God's healing power when people are broken and you're broken yourself. You go above and beyond. You love when you're hurting yourself, I've seen that in your life over and over again. You lead, you love, you live like Jesus. And I'm so proud to be a part of this community. You know, these, these little things that you have here, uh, these are all um, uh, wristbands from, th- these are kids that are going to camp this next week. You guys sponsor nearly every single one of these students. Whenever I asked a few months ago, he goes, hey, let's help our youth go to camp. We had many, many students that couldn't afford to go to camp. All of a sudden, you guys breaking out with all these thousands. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? Help me to go to camp. (laughs) And you guys sponsored all those guys. You put on baby, just yesterday, there was another baby shower that was put on because you saw a mom in need and you wanted to minister to her. You know why that pavilion is up? You, you build pavilions during pandemics because you want to reach out to this community. You know those, that pod that's out there with all those supplies and all that health stuff? You know why that thing's out there? It's because they were, look, I got a call one day from somebody. I don't know who it was, but it said, I'm so-and-so from the health department. And we need, we're, we're gathering all of our stuff, but we need a central location. And we're looking for someone to, to help us and, uh, to use their parking lot or use their facility or use their grounds to store this for just a little bit. We've gone to churches all around, and they keep saying no. Why? Because masks and mandates and health care and all this kind of stuff during the pandemic, that's not what we believe. Will you help us? I'm like, yeah, just park out there. You can stay there as long as you want. We'll only be there a week or two. I don't know. It's been a month now. I don't know who these people are. You guys want some health supplies? Go out there and grab them. Maybe they'll come back. But you provide for mourning families. People are hurting. People are going through difficult times, and you rise above those moments. You make all these flautas and beans and rice and all this kind of stuff during their hurting and their most difficult moments. You give pastors time to rest. You know why Pastor Joel went to Florida? He went over there for four weeks because there was a pastor who needed a break. He was on the verge of burnout. And we were able to send him for four Sundays in a row to go minister to a whole family so that the pastor can get some rest. I just came back from Atlanta to go minister uh, at a man's church. He hadn't had a vacation for 12 years. He's on the verge of burnout. And so we got together and, and we got seven weeks for him to go away. And we have pastors coming so we can go and minister to their congregation. So when they come back, he comes back, he comes back refreshed. It's not right for pastors not to have vacations. And I can say amen to that. Because it's not an easy job. It's not. But it's so worthy of it. Amen. Amen. We're not the only ones, though. You know, I can't just point the finger at us because if I'm not careful, pride will set in. We can't allow pride to set in. There's so many people that are shining their light in a dark world. Every now and then you'll get a glimpse of God's beauty and God's glory in our country. Let me enter Rachel Denhollander. Some of you guys might know know her. Some of you guys might have seen her. 
Den Hollander. Den Hollander. You guys don't know, that's the American gymnast. The first woman to publicly accuse USA Gymnastic team doctor Larry Nassar of sexual assault. Some of you guys might have seen that in the news here lately. 2016, she alleged that he repeatedly engaged in horrific and humiliating behavior while she was his patient. And his actions paved the way for over 265 women who came forward with their own accounts of abuse. Some of these women that he abused were people who had won the gold medalists like Ali Raisman and Michaela Maroney and Simon Biles. You guys seen some of those. 2018, a Michigan court found Nassar guilty on charges of a child pornography and sexual assault. A lot of women got affected by this man. But Rachel, she was one of the last individuals of over 150 victims to confront Nassar in the courtroom during that sentencing phase of that trial. And when her turn finally came, she addressed those initial remarks that came out of her mouth with those words that you see right there, how much is a little girl worth? And she was referring to all the other girls that had been tortured and harassed by this man. (coughs) Rachel's question hung in the air, and she says this, I submit to you that these children are worth everything. And then she begins to look at her accuser in the face And she begins to say these words right here. In our early hearings, you brought your Bible into the courtroom and you have spoken of praying for forgiveness. And so it is on that basis that I appeal to you right now, Mr. Nassar. If you've read the Bible you carry, you know the definition of sacrificial love portrayed is of God himself loving so sacrificially that he gave up everything to pay a penalty for the sin that he did not commit. And it's by his grace that I too choose to love this way. Should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you've done, the guilt will be crushing. And that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found and it will be there for you as well. I pray that you experience the soul crushing weight of guilt so that you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God. Which you indeed far, which you need far more than forgiveness from me, though I even extend that to you as well. Wow, that powerful. Everyone in that courtroom was silent in that moment. Wow, just like you said that. That's the way it was. And if Rachel chose in that moment to take advantage and make it about her because she was right anyway. She could have spew out a bunch of venom and just went at him and nobody would have said a word. After all, she was right. It was owed to her. But on that day, it was Jesus. It was not anger that was Lord of her life. She didn't go in that courtroom to win. She came to forgive. The kingdom of God went into that courtroom that day and she showed up with the sword of God's spirit. She showed up with the shield of faith and the wrecking ball of God's amazing forgiveness and love. That's who walked into that room. And like Paul said in Philippians, Rachel was one of those blameless and pure children of God, children of light in the middle of this perverse and dark generation. She was that child. By his grace, I too choose to love this way. You know why we get emotional and stuff like this? You know why we shed tears or kind of gulp? Because we're blinded by the light. We're blinded by the shine. When we see people walk this way, we're overwhelmed at God's goodness. How it can be displayed, not only through Christ himself, but through people of like faith like you and I. What you see me do, he tells the disciples, I need you to do that to the world. And that same truth is the same for us as well. Amen. Amen. So this morning, I don't know if you've already heard it, but there's a ring that you hear. And it's the call of God. It's a call from the master to do what? To come and follow. To come and follow him. 
So that what we see Jesus do in scriptures, that's what we need to do to one another. On a more practical note, what does working out our faith look like? Let me tell you what it looks like. What Jesus said, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works. Glorify your Father in heaven. Even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Whoever wants to be my disciples, deny yourself. Quit act like, quit, quit being right. Take up your cross. Follow after me. Listen, Jesus worked his way to the back of the line, not the front of the line. He was crucified by religious and Roman winners and was there on the pulpit of the cross between two losers. He didn't go to win. He came to lose so that others could win. You remember Pilate? John the 19th chapter. Remember Pilate? He was the man who was in authority in that moment. John 19, he goes, he, Pilate said, you refuse to speak to me, Jesus? Don't you realize I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? And Jesus replied, no, you don't. Somebody does, but it's not you. He could have easily called a legion of angels and put every single one of those people to shame, but he chose to lay all that down and serve you and I and all of humanity. We can choose to follow Jesus. All of us have a choice, but we can't get to choose what following Jesus looks like. How to behave. The call to come and follow looks and sounds a whole like Jesus when we see that in Scripture. Amen. So real quick for application, you can take a picture of this. You know, another way the, the, the Scripture looks at this, it calls it the law of Christ. The law of Christ is the same way as uh, saying this is how you should behave. The Apostle Paul writes it all over the place. But whenever you are struggling with individuals, I'm in the middle of a crazy moment right now where the law of Christ wants to be turned to the law of the devil because I'm facing opposition that I don't want to extend mercy. I want to extend a sniper so we can take this guy out. Being honest. He's like Pharaoh to me, enslaving people, enslaving us or trying to enslave us. But I'm turning it around and I'm trying to I'm trying to get to the place, and I am getting to the place. This morning, it was just a great moment as I'm driving to church. It's like, you know what, God? I haven't done this, but I'm going to choose to pray for Pharaoh. I'm going to rise above, and I'm going to pray for Pharaoh. Sometimes that's all you can do is just pray for him. And so whenever you're facing stuff with individuals or with they, here's some great questions. What would it look like? No, go back. What would it look like to love this person? What does it look like to love these people the way Christ loved me? What would a Christ-like response look like? What does it sound like? How can I put this person first? Instead of winning, what would it look like in this situation to go to the back of the line? And if there's anything I want you to brand and I want you to get a hold of and memorize it is this phrase right here. Because sometimes you don't know what to do. You don't know how to behave. And when you're not sure what to say or do, Ask what love requires of you. When, you don't, when you're not sure of what to say or what to do, ask, what does love require me to do? Amen? And I think you'll probably, by the Spirit of God, get the right answer. And that's what faith expressing itself through love looks like. That's how followers follow. That's what doers do. That's how the love of God behaves. Amen? Amen? Let me pray with you. Father, in Jesus' name, God, you know, well, you know where this lands and how this lands in our lives. Man, forgive us. Master, it becomes hard sometimes. But I thank you that you grace us in moments like this to rise above, to look at the bigger picture, not just this little uh, minor view, but a macro view, the bigger, the kingdom of God picture. Help us to see it that way because we know that lives will be impacted if we walk like you walked and expressed Jesus' love that it was expressed to us. So empower us, help us, 
We trust you. We commit this week. We commit our lives to you. We ask that you just forgive us and, and, and we repent of these things. And Lord God, we just want to move forward in your holy name. We trust you. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said, amen. amen. Man, the Lord bless you. Go and follow him. Amen. We'll see you next week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.